Well, <clears throat> okay, I think it's nine o'clock, so let's get started. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you have the great event I have uh, so far. Uh, thanks for voting. <clears throat> it's been excellent. I'm here today to talk to you a bit about the new upcoming uh, EU data protection regulation. How many of you here have heard of the GDPR before? <laughs> okay, good, a few of you. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you here have heard of OpenStack before? <laughs> okay, great. Uh, you should be surprised that uh, in Sweden, uh, when I usually hold this, it's the other way around. So more of them <clears throat> are familiar with GDPR than OpenStack. Uh, the thing is with GDPR is I usually illustrate it with this picture uh, behind me. It's from a good friend of mine at I IBM who first uh, talked about it. The GDPR is like uh, blind people trying to describe an elephant. It's all about <coughs> where they are, what they're feeling, and uh, yeah, it doesn't give a complete picture because it's very, very massive, very hard to get a full grasp of the GDPR. Uh, luckily, uh, we are going only to talk about the infrastructure and securing the infrastructure to be compliant with GDPR. So even if we are going to only to handle the tail of the elephant, we will be compliant in the tail end of the elephant. So that's the goal of this. Uh, I got a review from my earlier lecture where they were really disappointed. They didn't give uh, a complete explanation of all things GDPR in 40 minutes. And I said, well, that's a pretty big ask because <laughs> that's describing the complete of the elephant. It's a full day's uh, work. The GDPR, like I said, it's uh, three-layered. You will need policies, you will need processes, and you will need practice. It's the practice layer, the layer where you actually do something that comes down to you and the ops guys. It comes down to OpenStack. Uh, you should be happy with this because it's also a bit of the easiest layer to fix. You have pretty clear directives. Uh, GDPR itself is clear as mud, so <clears throat> don't hope to get too much from them. Uh, but I base my recommendations upon the Germans, because the Germans have already enforced privacy laws, uh, driven privacy prosecutions. And I dare say that if you err on the right side of the Germans, you will be safe in most European countries as well because, well, the Germans are the best at what they do in this area. So <clears throat> you can trust that no other country will have uh, more strict rules regarding this. Uh, this is a lecture about compliance. And it's important to know that security and compliance are not always the same thing. You can be secure but not compliant. And you can, of course, be compliant and not secure. So that's uh, other ways around. I am focusing on compliance. Hopefully, you should get both security and compliance at the same thing, because the meaning with compliance is, of course. Uh, what's a good example about security and compliance where they're not the same thing? Uh, one shining example is containers. Why? Because compliance it's all about surviving the che checklist. An auditor will come with a huge document with a lot of check boxes that he needs to tick off, check, 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 check. These checklists are made when Bill Clinton was still president. <laughs> They're made for physical hosts. When you run VMs, you have a one-to-one -one relationship uh, in regards to disks, to network adapters, to <coughs> Well, pretty much anything, you can translate a checklist based on a physical host, easy, to a VM or a virtual object. A virtual router is still a router. <coughs> you have the checklist. A network is still a network. But when it comes to containers, 
you will find areas where the checklist can't actually answer. And then it's up to the auditor to see if they have a flexible mind. This is not always the case. So if you run containers, you run the risk of running into an incomplete checklist. And this is something, well, certain uh, companies want to dare and try this and say it's an acceptable risk for us that we might be taken to court. And some companies don't want to do this. That's up to them. But like I said, from a security standpoint, I would be perfectly happy running a lot of sensitive information in containers. No problem at all. From a compliance perspective, well, you need to think about that. Some definitions I would try to keep, get people up to speed a bit about the GDPR quickly. Uh, personal data, that means anything that can identify a living individual, uniquely identify a living individual. My name is Kim Hindart. There's only one Kim Hindart in the world. So that's uniquely identifiable. Uh, if you're calling John Smith, then it's not. So it can vary a bit as well, but it's if you can be uniquely identified. This is important to know that the law says that indirectly as well. So pseudonymized data, anonymized data, is still privacy data according to EU now. And <clears throat> personal data is included even in our unstructured format. So mailboxes, personal data, same regulations. Processing, well, that's what you will do. Uh, anyone who are part of the information lifecycle is part of the processing. So here OpenStack comes in. I will limit myself to talk just about the infrastructure layer, about the OpenStack layer. Now, uh, if you're running an app, well, <laughs> you have a lot more to think about. Uh, luckily, we at the processing level of the infrastructure at the OpenStack only really needs to focus about this personal data breaches. <clears throat> and this means that uh, it might even be accidental. It's still a personal data breach. And like you see, loss, alteration, access to, store. This is important as well because if you actually allow personal data to be processed, that means that you can make a copy that you just to happen to send somewhere that is not legal, that's not allowed, that's being processed in the wrong way. And that's a personal data breach. Even if no one human being has seen the information, it's still against the law to transfer it outside the EU, for example. So if you have a backup that goes outside the EU, well, that's against the law. And then the question is, can they claim damages against this? Can they say, I was hurt uh, by you transferring my data, even if no human, other human, has ever seen that to another country? And yes, you can, because there was a case in Germany where this was actually the case itself. And uh, the person who claimed this won. So, yeah. <clears throat> Taking into account, this is what the law gives us from the ops perspective about security. Uh, it's an easy way you should see appropriate technical and organizational measures. That's what we get. Good luck. That's the EU way of saying we don't want to bother with technology. But we will reserve the right to, in hindsight, blame you. That's actually EU way. So what is appropriate technical measures? Well, we will try and solve that because, like I said, 
The Germans have actually run through this a bit with processes, so if we follow them, we will be on the safe side. Uh, like the data protection authorities uh, tell me when I ask them, but how do I know what, you be, what it means to be compliant? They say, you shouldn't be that worried, because if you run faster than your friends, the bear who chases you will eat your friends instead. You don't need to outrun the bear, you just need to outrun your friend. <clears throat> so, why should you care about the GDPR at all? Well, like I said, it's a law. You can be fined for a personal data breach up to 4% of the global turnover. So that it's, we're talking a lot of money. And for even minor infractions, like not having the appropriate access controls, like not having updated operating systems, it's a 10 million euro fine for these things. And you have an insanely increased uh, chance of being audited by the pure fact that any data subject that you might have within you, anyone uh, who has a personal record against you. So if you run a store or service or something in the app where anyone leaves their personal information, they have a right to audit you. So if you come to bad terms with a customer and you have mass, then they can just, for the heck of it, messing with you, require you to be audited. So the chance of being audited has, all, has increased a lot. And if you don't have your documentations in order then, well, then the checkbook with fines would come out. What I don't think, this is, was not, of course, the spirit of the law, but what I don't think people realize a bit is that there's a lot of money to be earned by doing this as well. So that's a risk factor you should take into account nowadays, that privacy data is a lot of hack value just for extortion, for ransomware. If I steal hack, uh, privacy data from you, and I know that you face a 10 million euro fine for that, I say, give me 1 million euro, and I give you back the data. Something <clears throat> to think about. I will go back to that. This is the law. That means that you in the ops who run OpenStack has a big chance of being thrown under a bus. I am the chief security officer at City Network, so I write the policies at City Network, and I have done this calculation that it's by far a lot cheaper to have a designated scapegoat within the company, some poor unsuspecting ops guy, than solving all the shit that is required to be legal with the GDPR. So, this is really why ops people especially should care. Because you have no way of totally absolving yourself of responsibility because it's the law. So like if a trucking company tells you you should run over the speed limits, well, the company will be in trouble because you're not allowed to ask that of your employees. But the employee himself who runs speeding will have no way of avoiding the fine itself. So this can trickle down to ops. Easy enough. You have a data protection officer at your company. You should talk to them a lot and make sure that what you're doing is approved by them. Then you don't have that responsibility. This is important enough. But like I said, we will go to what it means with the open stack itself. Uh, I'm usually asked distributions or not. Well, I will say that the community edition of OpenStack is good enough to handle the security demands of the GDPR. Uh, but from a distribution standpoint, it's exactly why I want a distribution, this one, because I can throw someone under a bus, and it's not me. That's what, 
uh, Red Hat, uh, SUS, Ubuntu is four. They're excellent under bus throwing, guys. Like I said, distribution-wise, the community edition, uh, it survives the checklist of auditors. They have these things. Uh, I was part of the OpenStack uh, contributions when it was named Cactus. Then I left for a while and came back when it was named Liberty. And it changed a bit between that. I would never dream of saying that the Cactus part of the release would actually survive all of this, but now OpenStack security has grown a lot and the foundation do an awesome job, really awesome job. Any of the security team here today? No? Well, they were excellent, so <clears throat> now that I said that, what you need to take into account when you do run a community edition, you can do this, like I said, you can make it perfectly <clears throat> fine for uh, GDPR audits, but you need to take into account the release cycle and the end of life. A end of life is a big no-no, always. That's so no software that's not security supported. That's big fat no. It's sensible, of course. I wish all of the companies would <laughs> respect this because that's just plain sense. There will be vulnerabilities out there, and it needs to be security supported. But what you will notice is that community editions have a very short lifespan of security support, so you need to update, keep on updating in a rapid pace if you use the community edition. Not all projects are security supported within the OpenStack. That's also important to remember. So if you want to use Manila, you won't find Manila here. Really important to know. If you want to use Manila right now, you need to go to distribution and make sure that they support Manila. So don't take this. Uh, I'm only pushing for the websites because this is a living thing, so it changes a lot. Uh, I've had uh, lectures before where people watched the video and complained to me, yeah, I followed what you said and I was blamed. Yeah, because it was a year ago. <laughs> Things happen, so keep you updated on this. It's important to know that. Uh, one of the demands within the GDPR is that you do a risk assessment. It's easy enough probability, severity. The problem with infrastructure, the problem with OpenStack, is that the severity will always be high. Uh, that's the part of it, it's infrastructure. Access to full databases, full VMs, full storage. A breach in the infrastructure is always, will always be highly in severity, so it's lowering the probability. And that's when best practice guidelines comes into mind. So, you need to follow the best practice guidelines because when the audit comes and you have had a data breach that you needed to report and the auditor comes to check up on this, then they will see, okay, this was a severe breach, it was back in the infrastructure. What did you take for precautions? And if you have not followed the best practice guidelines then, then you will be in a bit of trouble. Easy enough to say that. Uh, so, the damn Yorks at OpenStack actually did the best practice guidelines, so we don't have any deniability. Darn it. Forcing us to work. <laughs> How many of you has re have read this book? Ah, great. A few of you, anyway. All of you interested in keeping compliant with GDPR needs to read this book. You cannot avoid this if you want to be ensure that you won't be thrown under bus. This is the best practice guidelines, and it clearly states what the OpenStack thinks about things. And if you deviate from this, you will need to have a big and really damn good reason why you do that, 
and saying, oh, well, we didn't have the time or resources. That's not good enough. I was, part, uh, take, uh, was helping a bank who went to the EU and cried a lot about these new regulations. That we have a lot of systems. We were nowhere near time enough to fix this before 2018. And the EU took the books of the bank, looked at them, $10 billion profit, $10 billion profit, $10 billion profit. And they said, OK, if you spend $100 billion next year and you still have not fixed this in time, then you can come back and complain. So if you work for a company that's done a lot of profit, you are in big trouble if you don't follow the best practice guideline because you can't blame that we didn't have the time or resources. In the best practice guideline, I will go through it shortly. Uh, there is a lot of using TLS SSL encryption. This bases a lot. I just say control your PKI. Have a good policy for handling PKIs. <clears throat> this is also important because the checklist loves PKIs. They're very familiar with this. And it's been around for 20 years now, so they have a lot of issues with it. So keep in mind that you need to have a good root certification authority, you need to have a good process on how you check out certificates, and you need to have this about the certificate chain being completed. So make sure that your company has a good PKI system in place. That's important part. I will go through. Quite quickly, uh, it comes a bit to setting policies. The guide shows you where the policies are, but how do you set the policy that you ensure that you are compliant? Well, this is the basic default policy on most things. Uh, it's also the policy in common law against people that if it's not explicitly forbidden, well, then it's allowed. This is not a good policy to have if you want to be compliant. This is the policy you need to change to, to be compliant everywhere. Everything which is not allowed is forbidden. So deny all is the basic policy, and then you allow only the specific things you need to do. People say, oh, <laughs> hard. Yes, it is. It's one rule regarding policies that you can always fall back on. If you have any doubt at all, am I compliant? Look at this policy and say, OK, is this true? Then I'm good. If not, change it. You need to change this, but luckily as well, you can automate a lot of it. So automate. Automate is the best bullet against this. Where do you change this in the policies? Like I said, if you see policies in the policy files that have just dash, dash, and nothing in between. That means that it's allowed in general at large, and you can't have this. Always put a role here. Always put up. So every policy has a defined role. That means that no user created just as a user has any rights naturally by themselves. They always have to be assigned a role as well. You can design your own roles so this is easy enough, but remember this, because this is not by default. So you need to change it. Then it comes to easy parts like security groups and firewalls. Always, always, always have this method on your host that you uh, allow things specific. No ranges, I tell you. No ranges. Only single hosts. Single ports, one rule for all, each of them. It's easy enough if you automate, believe me, but you should really automate. But this is <coughs> what you need to do, because then you can review it. Luckily, OpenStack wants a lot of ports, a lot of traffic, a lot of intercommunication, but it's predictable. You have a really good set, so once you do this, once you have this set up, it's easy enough to maintain. But like I said, no humans should do this. This is strictly automation. 
regardless of what type of automation tool you use, any one of them is just fine. But automate and keep the policy intact. Because if you have this policy, then you will be safe when the auditor comes because you can say we did what we needed to we've done our really best this is appropriate guidelines this is best practice another thing important to remember is keep logs analyze logs secure logs decent enough it's not part of the open stack itself to have a logging system so you should have a remote syslog server something or something like that similar but just keep the logs it's good for evidence to prove that well it wasn't a problem in our end monitor events set up a monitoring system that gives alerts regular op systems gives alerts when something breaks down when something stops working when a service fails Monitor security events it's itself as well, especially authentications, because you want to have even successful authentications sent as an alert to a manager, because they need to know, okay, well, wait a minute, this was, is our uh, billing API user. That user shouldn't log in at this time. So monitoring systems <coughs> as well. Uh, any one of the good monitoring systems today works just fine. But remember to monitor events. <coughs> you need to sh have a good check on decide which event, uh, monitoring events are important. And you usually fail uh, to uh, forget that successful logins are just as important as unsuccessful ones. I would recommend that you follow a couple of uh, standards if you can. Uh, PCI DSS gives a really good framework that assures you that you're on the right side of things, as well as ISO 27018, who, are, who specifically points out rules regarding privacy. So if you follow these, you will be on the very side uh, safe side. PCI DSS is nice enough because you have automated checking and verification tools for this. So this is nice. I will show you one of them. It's called OpenSCAP. How many of you here are familiar with OpenSCAP? Ah, a few of them. Excellent. But the re for the rest of you, I will show you this one. This is really nice. Uh, I use it a lot. You have the OpenSCAP. I just quickly want to refer to you the OpenStack security guidelines. This is best practice. Like I said, you should, you should read this, but they have an awesome checklist here. Do I have Wi-Fi? Yeah. They have a great checklist with a lot of checks. Make sure you do follow this checklist read through it, follow it. Uh, like I said, make sure your policies are in order. Then you will be perfectly home safe about this. But like I said, now you all know that there is a check checklist. Let's go to OpenSCAP. This is automated checking. You can install daemons to do scheduled checkings. Uh, it's pretty easy enough, decent enough to have used this getting started. They will show you how to run a vulnerability check. So you install a scanner app, and then you run a scan based on a set policy. Uh, let me show you. Here I have my poor little dev stack I put up yesterday. And I have a scanning profile where I select uh, the profile for PC, PCI DSS and the XML file for this. And if I run this, it will do a lot of checks, as you see, uh, and I will get out a report. And then I will know that if this host is compliant or not for PCI DSS. 
This is really terrific to run on a regular basis. This is really terrific to run when the auditor comes as well. So uh, most distributions have this. Uh, I do know that one huge distribution uh, is working on this that's not, that doesn't have this just by package, but they have the libraries upstream and you can always get these things as well. So it works fine on pretty much all Linux. Uh, like you see, my cloud-based dev stack doesn't have a lot of security, uh, a lot of fails. Uh, you do get a HTML report directly as well, in a more readable format. Uh, so I do really recommend that you use OpenSCAP. It's an awesome tool to quickly verify that your host environment is secure enough as well. Well, that was pretty much what I had to say about securing OpenStack for the GDPR compliance. Any questions? Yeah? You mentioned that one vendor is working on integrating OpenStack for the compliance. Can you name that vendor? Uh, Ubuntu is working on it. Uh, Red Hat CentOS has this already uh, off the sh uh, shelf right away. Uh, you can get this on Ubuntu and it works fine but uh, you need to do some modifications. But they're working on it. I know that they have it in production. So if, if you buy a, sub, uh, a subscription, if you buy uh, a vendor subscription, you will get help with this immediately. So they have it. It's not always in the free edition, though. Yes, uh, I, I've written uh, things for uh, the <coughs> OpenStack best practice guides. So I've written in the OpenStack best practice as well. But you need to run the PCI DSS profile by itself and then run the OpenStack best practice profile. Are, are the profiles you've uh, yes, I've pushed them upstream, so I'm waiting for them to be completed, yes. Any more questions? Oh, okay. This is enough time. Thank you very much. <laughs>